I don't feel like I've ever seen more inconsistency in college football than I've seen here in 2024. I think it's a, the product of a lot of different things. Hello and welcome in. It's always college football. It is December 2nd and I'm your host, Greg McElroy. Thanks for being here. Please like, rate, subscribe to the show wherever you get the show. We appreciate you. It's our Monday takeaway edition here on Always College Football. We have a ton of takeaways from this past weekend. Some are really fun, some not so much. So I think for those of you that experienced challenging defeats, maybe this this is a place where you can come and feel better about it. Maybe in some cases you can feel worse about it, or we can help you understand why it happened. A uh, bunch of different takeaways. We'll hit the biggest games of the p- past weekend. We'll hit some conference realignment situations. We'll hit college football playoff. I will tell you some teams that I don't want to see in the college football playoff. If they get in, they can be a problem. If they don't get in, uh, then we'll always wonder what if. But if they get in and lay an egg, it also wouldn't surprise me. So a bunch of different chaos scenarios that we'll address today. Coaching carousel beginning to spin. And the transfer portal is open as well. So let's dive in and kick things off. Where else? With the Ohio State Buckeyes and the loss to the Michigan Wolverines. Takeaway number one, this Ohio State loss is completely inexcusable. Uh, I'm just going to flat out tell you exactly how I feel. When I watch this game, I watch these teams have seen all 11 games for the Ohio State Buckeyes this year in some form or fashion. Have watched Michigan probably at least eight times this season and just evaluating their performance, watching the game tape, watching it live, what have you. And my goodness, this one is very difficult to wrap your head around. And I think a lot of Ohio State fans are fair in saying that this is the worst loss of their lifetime. And doesn't really matter how old that person is. It might be a, a newborn that was born on November 26th to a, an Ohio State family. This is the worst loss of their lifetime. Uh, because I can look at their losses in the last three years and I can live with it because I looked at the personnel that Michigan had and the identity that Michigan had. And it was understandable why Ohio State was maybe bludgeoned a couple times. It makes sense. But this one is completely inexcusable, especially for a team that had won 17 out of 19 between 2001 and 2019. They were their own worst enemy. It it was hard to really wrap things up and and thinking that this game could go the way it went. We kind of told you Ohio State would have to screw it up. And boy, did they ever. Good news is Michigan almost screwed it up as well. So it was not the most appealing game as far as just watching and the quality is concerned. We'll start with the quarterback play. Will Howard, a couple of really bad, bad interceptions. Okay, a couple of really bad ones. The one that they threw out to the right, intercepted, taken back inside the five-yard line. Uh, Their kicker, Jaden Fielding, misses a couple field goals. Just, it's easy to point to individual plays, say that's why this happened, that's why this happened. It makes sense because this did this and who did that, what have you. But let's start with the game plan. And this one falls on the staff. It, it does. Um, I watched it, watched the tape, and now have drawn even stronger conclusions uh, than I had even yesterday after the initial glance at it. What I'm trying to figure out is that we know, we know – that Ohio State has offensive line challenges. That's a fact that's been established. We know that because they've had multiple injuries to the position. So why on 26 offensive plays are they going to run the ball in between the tackles for the most part? 26 different offensive plays, most of those runs hitting between the tackles. The exact position group that has given Ohio State the most challenges this year, the offensive line. Let's lean on them. They'll win us this game. And then it's a refusal to acknowledge the strength of Michigan's team, their defensive tackles, the two best players on their roster. Yep, we'll run right at them. Surely that'll catch them off guard. How many times did we see Judkins or Henderson just run right between the A-gaps, slamming right into the middle of the offensive line? As a result, 16 of the 26 plays that I referenced went for either negative yards or... Zero or one yard, basically. I mean, more than three quarters 
of those runs went for two yards or less, which might, means they kind of always were living a little bit behind the sticks, and it kind of always meant that they were going to be in some difficult spots. Uh, what I also don't understand is when you are a team that has a pretty good offense and you're going against a team with a pretty average offense, why don't you try to force the tempo a little bit? Like, why didn't they use it? You look at the one time they used a little hurry up, the one time they kind of increased the urgency a little bit, that was there near the end of half, and it was perhaps their best offensive drive of the day. Six of eight through the year, they went for 58 yards. They went down and they scored a touchdown right before the half. Like, why didn't they come out in the second half and say, hey, clearly our tempo stuff has given them some fits. Let's live with that a little bit more. And one thing that we've also acknowledged this year is that Michigan's secondary is just not very good, especially in the absence of Will Johnson. Why is it that they had several first downs inside the 25-yard line of Michigan and they never really targeted, at that point, Jeremiah Smith? Now, they had a couple penalties that he drew. They did hit one for the touchdown, and that was significant. But why is it that if penalties and or touchdowns are going to be the result, why didn't they look in his direction more often? And how can you possibly justify a zero target half for Jeremiah Smith? That was in the second half. Look, Will Howard is going to get a lot of blame for this. And while there have been moments this year where it's been a little bit inconsistent, um, there was occasionally some bad decisions. Yes, he did lose a fumble or two throughout the course of the year, but for the most part, he always bounced back. The first interception is a tough one to justify. Trying to hit Carnell Tate, hadn't really turned around. Amir Hall jumps in front of it, takes it to the two-yard line. That was the only touchdown scored on the game for Michigan. You just can't give the ball to Michigan in the short field. You just can't under any circumstances. And I just don't understand for the life of me why you would lean so heavily on an offensive line that is without Seth McLaughlin at center and that was without Josh Simmons at left tackle. Ohio State's defense was stellar all throughout the season. 11 and a half games of outstanding defensive play with the exception of some big plays given up against Oregon, right? Well, here in this game, most important situation, most important game of the year because it was the rivalry game that's been circled for the calendar year, and they can't get off the field in the second half. You can't get off the field late in the game. Uh, and we've seen that multiple times where Ohio State's defense on the field, it's the star of the show, and Michigan runs it down their throat like they did in 2021, like they did in 2023, and they put the game on ice. It is one that is impossible to wrap your head around. It was a terrible performance in the Buckeyes and one that will pain Ohio State fans for many years to come. As far as Michigan is concerned, and look, I know a lot of people that are giving Michigan tremendous credit in this game. They deserve tremendous credit for their effort, and they deserve tremendous credit for dictating the way the game was going to be played. But this game was all about Ohio State. No disrespect, Michigan. No disrespect whatsoever. But this was all about Ohio State's ineptitudes because Michigan had several ineptitudes of their own. But Ohio State, as soon as Michigan made a mistake, Ohio State would say, hold my beer and make one themselves. So great job. Mullings had the big run there at the end. That was significant. Um, it was just really eye-opening to see how that game went. And if I'm the Buckeyes, I'm sick to my stomach about what was lost. Not just the game, not just a spot in the Big Ten title game, but the mental aspect of having to think for another 364 days about that performance and how you allowed Michigan to dictate terms would be something that'd be almost impossible to overcome. That will haunt those players and that coaching staff forever. I'm just telling you, they will never forget just how bad that performance was. Takeaway number two, the Big Ten title game is exactly what America wanted. Penn State and Oregon, right? Okay, I say that tongue in cheek, and it's not Penn State's fault. Look, they had a relatively favorable schedule. They took care of business against the teams they were going to take need to take care of business against. And here enough, they find their way into the Big Ten title game where they'll have a chance now to punch their ticket for a first round bye. We'll start with Penn State. We'll start with the good from their performance this past weekend. The good was the defense. Uh, the defense has been there all year long for Penn State. So this is not that surprising. But second play of the game, or first play of the game, excuse me, after the opening kickoff, they lose a fumble. Defense gives up one play, 25-yard touchdown drive, <laughs> I guess is what we're calling it. 
MJ Morris hits Prater, touchdown. It's like, okay, well, that's this will be interesting. Well, from that point forward, Maryland finished the season or finished the game um, with about, what, 72 yards in the first half, thereabouts. Uh, how about Abdul Carter and how he was able to get home multiple times against one of the best passing attacks in the Big Ten? Uh, they had very little going through the year whatsoever, and they couldn't manufacture hardly anything. It also looks to another part of the good here. It looks like Singleton, while he did have the early fumble, does look to be over whatever things plagued him there in the middle of the season. Now, he had kind of been a little banged up, you could tell, from time to time, but on 13 carries, he goes for 88 yards and a couple scores, and then Tyler Warren continues to do amazing things. This time, you know, he has a a throw, 32 rushing yards, uh, six catches for 70 yards and a touchdown. So Tyler Warren, Singleton's rounding into form. The offense, I think, is starting to get to a point where they're looking pretty good, and the defense has been there all year. Here's the bad for Penn State. How do you put the ball on the ground four times and lose only one? Very fortuitous that the ball was on the ground multiple times in the game. And actually, two of the four fumbles, Drew Aller and Bo Pribula, were able to make positive yardage after picking the ball back up after losing the ball. So uh, a little bit fortunate with some of the balls and the bounces, it wouldn't have made a difference. Even if Maryland had recovered all four fumbles, it wouldn't have probably ended any differently. Might have been slightly tighter margin, but still, Penn State, solid performance. 11 wins in the regular season for the first time since 08, so credit to the Nittany Lions. Oregon will be their competition next week. It is... There's really not a lot to take away from Oregon's performance. The pass rush was the best part about it. Uh, Ten sacks in the performance against Washington, against eight different eight different players contributed to the sack total. Jordan Birch and Mayo, uh, Mateo Uyunglele combined for four and a half sacks. And I do think, too, the way Oregon can just pour it on you. So the game can be tight there for a little bit. It can be tight. It can be uncomfortable. And the next thing you know, you blink your eyes, you walk out, you have a quick conversation with a friend, and you come back and Oregon's up 28-6 after it was 7-6 about two minutes earlier. So the way they they can pour points on you in bunches becomes very demoralizing very quickly. So I think Oregon, not a lot of bad to take away from the performance either. There's a lot to like about what we've seen from the Ducks. And I think they'll be a decent favorite against Penn State. But it's nice to see Penn State now be challenged for the first time since the Ohio State game. Let's see how much that offense has grown since that time. It's their first title game, conference title game since 2016. And I think it's going to be a fascinating one. Either way, whoever's in is in. Whoever's out is probably the five seed. So Big Ten title game, really not that big a deal as far as the potential outcome. But for both teams that are not always in the title hunt, it's going to be fun to see, especially with the new team like Oregon. More on that here in just a little bit. Takeaway number three, Texas is looking like a traditional SEC team. Okay, When you think Southeastern Conference, I know the league has evolved the last few years, right? The league has evolved now to become more about weapons and passing attacks and perimeter football. Everyone still has really good. Everyone in the league, for the most part, has a at least two, maybe three rock solid and quality defensive linemen, but it's not really the same line of scrimmage league that it once was. It's definitely become a little bit more versatile and a little bit more athletic. It's moved in that direction. But Texas is looking a lot like the teams that dominated the Southeastern Conference for the better part of a decade and a half. Dominant run game, dominant defensive line, and a team that just kills your will on the opposition. Let's start with the offense. It's been really fun to watch this offense evolve this year because at first you're thinking it's going to be a passing attack with some of the attrition they had at running back in the preseason. I think it's going to be a heavily, heavily incentivized passing attack. A lot of big plays created, a lot of smoke and mirrors that Steve Sarkeesian will dial up with catch and runs and screens. He does a great job in being creative there, but this team has really morphed into becoming a very balanced output. 458 total yards this past week. That's their second best performance against an SEC school this year outside of the performance against Mississippi State. That was months ago, and Mississippi State's a bottom dweller in the SEC. And to make things even more impressive, to play this well on the road in a hostile environment after they lose their left tackle and mainstay seven plays into the game, 
is pretty impressive. Kelvin Banks gets hurt, no problem. In comes the backup, and it shouldn't be much of an issue moving forward. So to weather that storm and to still run the ball as well as they ran the ball is really impressive. I think a lot of credit goes to Quintravian Wisner, who has really grown into becoming the bell cow guy for this team. Look, the preseason, like we talked about, he was kind of an afterthought. It was really about CJ Baxter and then Baxter gets hurt. And then you think it's going to be Jaden Blue and, and Blue's been a little up and down. The one thing that we kept hearing about why is he's super talented, but ball security is something that is a little concerning. Well, here in this game, the biggest game for Texas this season because it was the next game and the most meaningful game for Texas, no one was on the line. He goes for 186 yards on 33 carries. Now, those 186 yards, second highest single game total by a Texas running back over the last two seasons. Jonathan Brooks is the only one to eclipse that yardage number, and that was against Kansas last year. He went for 220. The other thing I liked about this was that Quinn Ewers, it looked like for the first time since he got hurt against UT San Antonio, he looked like he was capable of contributing a little bit more with his legs. He left the pocket a few different times. Looks like there were some chances where maybe that pass rush got a little aggressive and he takes off. And then sure enough, he picks up a couple big third down conversions, one for 26 yards there early in the game and another for eight yards a little bit later on. So he looked a little bit healthier. Now, is there stuff to clean up for Texas? Absolutely. Are they a finished product? By no means. But you have to be encouraged by what you've seen from the rushing attack and from the defense all season long. I want to get to the defense just for a moment because we have talked a lot at least over the course of the offseason. And I don't feel like we've appropriately spent enough time on Texas's front, their defensive line, here this season. Look, they have been super stout. They're deep. They're physical up the middle of the defense. But I actually think, think back to last year. Think back to where they were last year and the defensive tackles they had that could take over the game, whether it was Tavondre Sweat, who won the Outland Trophy, or whether it was... Uh, the other defensive, defensive tackle last year, Byron Murphy, who was impossible to block and was constantly applying pressure. I look at those two guys and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, like, man, how are you going to replace them? I don't know if they've replaced those guys individually, but they're just as good and just as disruptive along the front, except more of the disruption has shifted to the edges of the defense. These defensive ends are off the charts, and several of these guys can play inside and out. This is a handful of a unit to try to block, and if you have a weakness, they can exploit it because they can move speed to the inside, strength to the outside, and vice versa. So very, very encouraged by the growth that we've seen on display. In this game against a and there was never a point in which I felt like a and was going to get into this football game. It just never felt capable. Texas did to a and what Ohio State should have done to uh, Michigan. The only way a and was going to get in this game was if the Longhorns made mistakes. And guess what? They did. On multiple occasions, the Longhorns made huge mistakes. The pick six was terrible. You get pressure up the middle. You miss a choice route inside. It gets taken back to the house. That was a bad decision by Quinn Ewers. Bad execution. Poorly poorly anticipated across the board. Just an awful play. That was seven points for the Aggies. You have a blocked punt a little later in the game. That gives the Aggies life inside the 20-yard line, but that play results in a goal line stand. So looking at all of it, like the only way a and was going to win this game was by Longhorn mistakes. And Longhorns made them, but the other side of the ball picked up the, the mistakes that were made and it didn't result in some catastrophic issue. As far as AM is concerned, it just proved how far away they are at this point. The red zone play was not great. The Amari Daniels getting stuffed on second, third, and fourth down inside the two-yard line is something that would be challenging as well. Uh, to stomach if you're the Aggies. It just goes to show this is a really demoralizing loss, but if you are Texas AM, know that the expectations of this season were to be about eight and four. That's where people thought this team would be. That's where you are. So you didn't underachieve, you didn't overachieve. You came back to earth a little bit and it hurts to lose three games down the stretch like you did against South Carolina, Auburn, and Texas. 
but this team did a lot of good things this season and should feel good about where they're at and the young players that they have moving forward in the program. Takeaway number four, the Notre Dame fighting Irish machine keeps on rolling. They've now won 10 straight by a margin, combining all the scores of 441 to 134. So they're averaging over the course of the last 10 games about 44 points a game offensively and giving up about 13. Pretty dang solid, okay? This was probably the toughest test that they've faced so far as far as personnel on the offensive side of the football. The one thing that hasn't slowed down, though, has been the rushing attack. And Jeremiah Love, probably the best player on the field. Most of the time when he steps out on the field, he's probably the best player. Now, him getting banged up and not being available there in the fourth quarter, got hurt in the third quarter. will be interesting, I think, to see where that goes, if that has a lingering effect. I've heard multiple things. We'll talk about his injury in just a second, but kind of give you an update there here in just a minute. It does feel nice, though, as an Irish fan to know that if Jeremiah Love can't go, Jadarian Price will be able to pick up the load. All right, Jadarian did a really nice job, 111 yards, 12 carries, 36-yard touchdown. They gave Notre Dame that 21-14 lead. The run game has been really, really, really difficult to defend all season long. And it was again for USC. And if you look at SC, now people will say, well, it's Lincoln Riley. Oh, it's SC. If you look at SC this year, they have not been just destroyed on the ground with the exception of one performance. That was against Michigan. That was week three. So there's only really been one team that has committed to pounding the Trojans over and over and over again. Now, Michigan went for nearly 300 yards in that game. All right. Like I said, that was a long, long time ago. But if you look at Jadarian Price, Jeremiah Love, Riley Leonard, they combined to go for 260 on 37 carries. And it, you're doing some quick math. That's about seven yards a pop. So pretty good place to be with the rushing attack against a defense that has been much stouter against the run than they have been in recent years. Jeremiah Love's injury, uh, we've heard everything from a shin contusion to a knee injury, something worth monitoring. But fingers are crossed that it won't be something that will have a lingering effect. The playoffs, after all, are about 18 days from today. So you'd have some time on your side. But you would love to get him back in practice if he's capable of going there in the week leading up to the first playoff game, which would be on December 20th. So we'll see where they all shake out. They're in. They're likely going to be at home. But it, who's it going to be against? And what will their seed be overall? Defensively, the defense, and I thought the pass defense kind of struggled a little bit for the Irish in this game. They gave up 360 through the air. Um. I also look at it, and I and I think to myself, it was Christian Gray, and we had kind of said this last week. We had said, look, Christian Gray has had a lot of positive moments in this game, uh, in this season, has been very, very solid, but he gave up probably 100 yards to the year just on himself. Uh, he also had a couple of pass interference penalties. Uh, now, he struggled, but it's not necessarily always about where you start, it's about where you finished, because on one of the most important plays of the game with SC driving, he anticipates the back shoulder throw. He snags it at the 21-yard line and takes it all the way back, right? I mean, he snags it, or excuse me, from the 21-yard line going in, he snags it at around the goal line, takes it all the way back to the house. And the game that could have been very, very tight and very, very uncomfortable, him taking that 99-yard touchdown was massive for this Irish defense. But he's got to shore up some things in coverage because he struggled with this quality passing attack and this quality receiver core that the Trojans used over and over again. And then on the second pick six, it was really the pressure up the middle that forced Mayava to drift back, throw it off his back foot where Watts snagged it easily and took it to the house. So very encouraged by what I saw both offensively and defensively from the Irish, but I'd be remiss if we didn't at least acknowledge the third phase. Pretty sweet throwback. <laughs> on the punt to Mitchell Evans, the fake punt deep in their own territory. You get Tyler Buckner in there, hand it to him. He makes a throwback. Evans catches it. And that was a pretty gutsy call by Marcus Freeman and a well-executed fake punt that kept the drive alive. So I love how the Irish are playing right now. I really do. I think they're going to be a handful in the playoffs and look forward to seeing them hosting a game in South Bend here in a couple weeks.
Takeaway number five, changing conferences isn't that hard, is it? <laughs> well, looking at all of this, man, I think most of us thought, or at least I know I thought, that changing conferences would be a real challenge, a real step up for several teams. What I've now found is that maybe it's not as significant as I once thought because one, not all conferences are created equal, not all teams are created equal, and not all schedules within the conference are created equal as well. We'll start in the ACC where SMU has punched their ticket to the conference championship game. And SMU, remember early in the season, they lose to BYU, they make a quarterback switch, and they have been outstanding in their opening season against ACC competition. This was a team last year that, remember, they were 11-3 last season. So they were a good team coming in. You felt good about their trajectory and where SMU would be in the future. I thought there'd be a little bit of turnover. I thought there'd be a little bit of a challenge in accommodating themselves to the physicality that you would now see at the Power 5 level. It wasn't a problem whatsoever. Now, if you take the SMU and you play them in the Big Ten, you take SMU, play them in the SEC, I don't know, would they have fared much better? I have no clue. I think that's a hypothetical argument that's unnecessary. But I do know this, is that SMU went 11-3 and last year. They were 11-0 and against G5 teams and 0-3 and against Power 5 teams. This year, 11-1 and against both G5 and P4. So pretty impressive with what we've seen from SMU. I think they've been very dynamic, but the most, probably one of the most underrated parts of a playoff contending team might be SMU's defense. Nobody seems to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it, but it's certainly worth acknowledging just how good that group is playing. They're going to be a handful if and when they get in the college football playoff. The SEC, the Texas Longhorns, they'll punch their ticket to their first SEC championship game. I do think that Texas is the beneficiary of a fairly manageable schedule. It's no disrespect to the Texas Longhorns, but if you made Texas play, let's just say Oklahoma's schedule, would things be a little bit different for Texas? It might or it might not be. Like I said, hypotheticals, I'll never know. But I do know this. I do know that this process of the SEC transition for Steve Sarkeesian and staff started years and years and years ago. So to think, well, that this was just a year one. No, no, no. This started by going and evaluating size speed combination guys years ago that they think could adequately disrupt when they got into the SEC. They circled 2024. They said, this is the year that we plan on arriving. They got there early last year with a great team, made it all the way to the college football playoff, beat Alabama in the process, and I think proved to everyone proof of concept that if we can go on the road and beat Alabama in Tuscaloosa, the transition into the SEC won't be nearly as difficult as some people forecast it. And you look at their roster too, it's really more about roster. Tell me a roster in the SEC right now that you'd rather have than Texas. And people will say, well, look at the composite rankings and the team composite. Like the team composite to me is nonsense. I'm not saying it's completely irrelevant, but I'm just saying you look at, like you're telling me Clemson is the fifth best roster in the country. Come on, man. No way. Not even close like, at all. So, I, and last year, you look at Washington's roster. They had 10 guys, I believe, get drafted. Where was their 247 composite ranking? Come on. All right. So I look at the personnel and the development and all this the stuff. Texas has done it all. They've done a tremendous job in the portal. They've done a tremendous job in talent development and talent acquisition. And Steve Sarkeesian had them perfectly placed and ready to handle what was a pretty manageable SEC schedule. They took care of their business and now we'll have a chance to exact revenge on the one team that got them this year, the Georgia Bulldogs. The Big Ten and the Big 12, I'm combining these two. Oregon and Arizona State are both playing in their conference championship games in their first year in their respective leagues. So is this more about the Big Ten and the Big 12 or is this more about the relative strength the last few years of the Pac-12? I think it's a little bit of a combination of both. Because I look at Oregon, and Oregon transitioning to the Big Ten is not a huge surprise. Dan Lanning, cut from the Kirby Smart cloth, has spent time in the SEC and has tried to create 
an SEC style roster out West by going and getting and look at how many guys they have on their roster that they added in the portal that have some SEC experience. Evan Stewart, Jordan Birch, a handful of other guys that have been in a situation where they've played against top level competition. So when they got out West, they, they handled their business. I mean, even dating back to when they had Bo Nix, like they have SEC caliber players, which are pros in many spots. And they have now put together not just SEC caliber players, but other pieces from other places that have been really good as well. They have a very clear and established identity that centers around a passing attack, but can also beat you in the run game. They're built from the inside out with great defensive and offensive line talent. So them transitioning to the Big Ten was not that surprising to see them have success year one. The other thing is I think the Big Ten for a while, outside of Ohio State and maybe a few other places here and there, has not really had to defend weapons like this on a week-to-week basis. So I think Dan Landing acknowledged, hey, you know, if we cannot just win at the trenches, which is how you're going to have to win the Big Ten, but we can also beat you by throwing it over your head, that's something that a lot of these Big Ten teams haven't seen. And I think that Oregon now has mastered that identity that will be challenging. It just will Oregon continue to be able to create mismatches on the perimeter against Big Ten teams in the future? We'll find out, but have to be pretty optimistic with what they've seen. And then finally in the Big 12, Arizona State, one of the most staggering and surprising turnarounds in the college football season has been Arizona State. To go from 3-9 and nine last year to 10-2 and two this year, one win away from a college football playoff berth, it's been one of the great stories to see uh, Kenny Dillingham at his alma mater and getting things done and doing the things that he's had to do. It's really amazing, too, to see their identity. Uh, they want to run the football. Cam Scadaboo is one of the best players in the country. He, at one point in his career, was an FCS superstar, has run for 14 touchdowns, has added nearly 500 yards to the air um, on, on the receiving end uh, through the air, has been over 1,200 yards rushing. The guy has just been amazing. And it's been cool to see them center the offense around him at times. But when it hasn't been about him, it's been about a young quarterback in Sam Levitt who's just gotten better and better and better and better. Now, we will be monitoring their wide receiver, Jordan Tyson, who was seen wearing a sling on his shoulder at the end of the game. So hopefully he'll be available for the Big 12 title game. But, man, clearly changing conferences, it can't be that bad, is it? No, I think it's a combination of many things. One, teams knowing that they need to kind of circle the year that they make the entrance into it. Two, teams not really knowing how to defend some of these teams because they're unfamiliar a little bit with how Kenny Dillingham, with how Dan Lanning, with how uh, Steve Sarkeesian, and with how uh, Rhett Lashley are going to attack you. And I'll be curious to see if this success can continue because I do think it's got a chance to, but I also think things could come back in a big way as teams get more and more comfortable playing against these different competition. Here's some teams that you absolutely don't want to play, or maybe you do. I think you look at these teams, and and it's kind of amazing. I don't know if you guys feel this way. Like I, I feel like when I've watched teams for years and years and years, um, it felt like the best teams – were just outrageously consistent. Like you just knew what you were going to get. The second you put on the tape, or the second you turned on a game, or the second you went in person and watched them, you just knew what you were going to get. But the level of inconsistency that we see from a play-to-play basis or from a quarter-to-quarter basis or half-to-half or game-to-game, I don't feel like I've ever seen more inconsistency in college football than I've seen here in 2024. I think it's the product of a lot of different things. One, I think the portal has a lot to do with it. Two, I think team culture or lack thereof plays a factor. I think three, because many teams don't have great depth because the second they're sitting there as a third year sophomore, they're like, man, you know, I don't want to be a backup or a role player again this year. I want to leave and become a starter at a smaller school. So they leave. And that means the next man up for you as a backup, say middle linebacker is a true freshman. So you get young in a hurry and young players are inconsistent. And then I also think too, with where we've gone from an offensive identity standpoint, A lot of it has to do with quarterback play. So if your quarterback plays great, you're great. If your quarterback plays poorly, you're poor. 
you don't play very well. It's as simple as that. It's a very quarterback dependent sport now, and it's become more like the NFL in that way. Like in the postseason, we think about NFL postseason. Well, what wins in the postseason? A great quarterback play, right? Most of the time. There's a reason why Mahomes has three rings, right? If your quarterback can't play well in the postseason, you probably don't have much of a chance. And I feel like that's carried over into college, and that's carried over at sometimes into the regular season for college football as well. Let's go through a couple teams, though, that I think are a huge problem if they play well. But, man, they can get got by anybody if they play poorly. Let's start with Alabama, probably the most obvious. There were times, and I feel like the Auburn game summed up Alabama's season in many, many ways. Uh, watching the Iron Bowl, calling the Iron Bowl. For Alabama, it was two steps forward and one step back. It felt like the entire game. So you can have a comfortable lead, never really feel threatened, and then at the same time, never really feel comfortable either because of all the mistakes that you made along the way. And that's kind of how Alabama has been all season, where they can have tremendous performance at times from Jalen Milrow, where he makes four or five throws that are outstanding. And then there are times where Jalen Milrow has substandard ball security and fumbles it twice. You can have times where your wide receiver in Ryan Williams, who's a true freshman, is incredible, like he was at times throughout the course of the season in the first eight or nine weeks. Or it can be the guy that in the last couple weeks drops three passes in the last two games, one of which would have been a touchdown on a perfectly placed deep ball down the field. And he fumbles on the opening possession against Auburn. It's like up and down. You can have a team that defensively has been incredible at times in the second half of the season where they give up close to 10 points in in a game defensively and even in the Oklahoma game where it was really bad statistically especially in the first half they give up 250 yards rushing overall in the game they also only held Oklahoma to 10 points offensively because if you really look at it Oklahoma scored 24 but seven were on a pick six and another seven the drive started at the 10 yard line so and then you have other games where Alabama's defense like they were against Vanderbilt where they couldn't get off the field on third down, they couldn't get off the field on fourth down, and they gave up 40 points. It's just painful inconsistency. You catch them on the right day, they'll kill you, just like they did against LSU. Catch them on the wrong day, they can look as human as the day is long, like they did against Oklahoma. Painful inconsistency. The same can be said for South Carolina. Now, I think a lot of people will look at South Carolina and think to themselves, okay, they are this close, whether it's an ankle injury away against LSU or a performance where they, you know, uh, almost beat Alabama. Uh, there's a two point game in the performance. But then you also have to acknowledge the game that they had against Ole Miss, where it's like, what, what was that? You know what I mean? They, they beat Clemson in a gutsy performance, and Lenora Sellers goes for 170 yards on the ground and just does amazing things, miraculous things as the game goes along. Or we can see them barely hang on and beat ODU in the first week of the season. You know, the inconsistency with South Carolina has been pretty remarkable. Now, I will say this South Carolina, the final six games of the year, they are looking like a much better outfit as things have gone along. They're kind of peaking at the right time and have been playing their best football down the stretch. But even the performance on Saturday wasn't elite by any stretch of the imagination. So South Carolina, one of those teams that they got in the playoff, look out, they can beat anybody. What about Ole Miss? Ole Miss, I still think Ole Miss, if you look at their three losses, they're almost tough to wrap your head around. All right, Ole Miss against Kentucky uh, had Kentucky at fourth and seven on Kentucky's own 20-yard line. And Brock Vandegrift, who really didn't throw the ball down the field with a lot of consistency all year long, hits by far his best throw of the season down the left sideline. Catch is made, first and 10. They end up scoring the game-winning score. But earlier in the game, Ole Miss had three defensive penalties that extended drives Three different defensive penalties on third down that extended one drive. Three penalties on one drive led to their other touchdown. So the fact that they lost that game was almost entirely about Ole Miss. How about the performance that Ole Miss had against LSU? Complete control, 
LSU never led in the game. Not one time did they lead in the game, not for one second of game action until the final play of overtime where they got the right matchup and threw a back shoulder. What about when you look at the game against Florida? Ole Miss had how many red zone penetrations and zero points to show for it because of short yardage ineptitudes? They were two for five or three for six on short yardage, all of which were taking points off the board. They lose the game by four. If they would have just kicked a couple field goals, it would have been maybe a very different outcome. So Ole Miss somehow finds their way. And I think all of these are, by the way, unlikely. They're at the mercy of what happens elsewhere. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But if you look at the inconsistencies, like those are three teams I wouldn't want to play. But at the same time, if you catch them on the wrong day, they could be really, really human. Then how about Arizona State? We talk about Arizona State. Arizona State, man, they just ran for 148 yards in the first half. They ran for 281 overall. The offensive line continues to get better. Cam Scadaboo is amazing. Three first-half touchdowns in the performance. Jordan Tyson, their wide receiver, does get hurt in the game. But you look at everything else and how they can elevate around him, that's pretty significant. Arizona State, man, do they catch some right matchups? Like Everyone's like, oh, yeah, Arizona State put them in there as the 12 seed, the 5 seed will handle them. I'm telling you, don't be so sure. This team is going to be better probably when they tee it up in the playoff. If they make it, they got to win this week. But if they make it, they'll probably be better in a couple weeks than they are right now. What about Tennessee? Tennessee, and while they got into an early hole against Vanderbilt, they were down 14-0 in the blink of an eye. Dylan Sampson flips the script. He goes for a buck 78. Nico Iamaleava has four passing touchdowns. He's the first Tennessee player to have back-to-back four touchdown passing games. That's been a long time. First player to do that since Tyler Bray back in 2012. So it's been a while since, and, and he's a guy who's, it looks like his confidence is growing a little bit. And Tennessee might become a problem in the postseason if their quarterback can t- continue to play well and the running game stays really hot and the pass rush continues to be a problem. And then finally, what about Miami? Miami, they lose, obviously. They're now 10 and 2. There's no guarantee they make the playoff. But if this team could just get a little bit better when it comes to third down defense, they gave up seven of 10 on third down to Syracuse. All right. They've been pretty solid at times this year, but their two losses against Georgia Tech and against Syracuse, it was all about third down and fourth down. Against Georgia Tech, they couldn't hit third downs offensively. Against Syracuse, they couldn't get off field on third downs. They also had three turnovers on down against Georgia Tech defense uh, when. Miami was playing against Georgia Tech. So that's significant as well. But you'd want to get into a shootout with Cam Ward and company? Have at it. I think they're a huge problem if they somehow make their way in. And I think, too, yeah, their resume, maybe not great at all, right? Resume has been actually quite, I don't know, underwhelming. But if you really look at it, tell me this. The win against Florida is probably a pretty good win. Win against Louisville is probably a pretty good win. And Florida now, by the way, speaking of hot teams, Florida just had eight sacks again. And they've had tons of sacks down the stretch. Their defensive line's getting amazing. They just had five more takeaways forced this past week. It's maybe Florida. You know, they're one of the – I'm not saying they get in the playoff. Obviously not. I know they don't. I'm saying, like, these are teams you don't want to play, and Miami beat them earlier in the season. So just something worth noting, something worth acknowledging. Takeaway number seven. Rivalry games still remain the most consequential game of the year. And we had wondered this, too. We all wondered this. Would rivalry games still be held in such high regard, especially if there's a scenario where the rivalry game is played multiple times a year? So the one that we all threw out, well, what if Michigan and Ohio State played on a rivalry weekend, then they had to play the following week and play in the Big Ten Championship? Would that water down Michigan and Ohio State? Clearly not. The vitriol on both sides was tangible all weekend long. Michigan wins the game. Their players try to plant the flag at midfield after pulling off the massive upset. Well, next thing you know, there's a melee at the 50-yard line between Ohio State and Michigan. It still means more by far than any other game of the season. What about Alabama and Auburn? There was a bunch of chippiness that was going on. A couple of unsportsmanlike penalties called against Alabama, against Devontae Smith, 
and against Malachi Moore. Should there have been two called on Auburn at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. They were going at it on Auburn's sideline. So clearly, testy environment between Auburn and Alabama and the smack talk that was going on the week before led to what was an incredibly intriguing and hard-fought Iron Bowl victory for the tie. What about Maryland and Penn State? Mike's Loxley, Mike Loxley, the head coach of Maryland, all up in arms because James Franklin goes and punches it in and, and scores again. And James Franklin's done this a million times. This was not overwhelmingly surprising. When they get up and they have a chance to twist the knife, they do. Mike Loxley didn't like that. Clearly, things were a little testy there after the game. What about Florida, Florida State? Florida State, one of the worst seasons in the history of Florida State football. They finish off 2-10. and 10. Florida goes to plant the flag. Mike Norvell tosses the Gator flag as he, fast as he can from the Seminole logo there in the midfield. Understandable, too. Who can blame him? Uh, the frustrations of the season mounting, and I don't know if Florida should have done that. I don't think it was cool, but at the same time, that's what's been going on. How about North Carolina and NC State? NC State, they didn't even get to midfield before North Carolina stopped it right there. And obviously a fight then breaks out in the aftermath. It was wild. I mean, all throughout the game. You got another one uh, was Arizona State. They plant the pitchfork in the middle of the A there in Tucson. So even though that there was this concern from all of us, us traditionalists, there was concern that the that the rivalry games wouldn't carry as much fire. If you saw multiple times, maybe it wouldn't mean as much. Well, that's no longer the case. Let that record reflect that rivalry games and the animosity that was on display multiple times this weekend is still of the highest levels of importance and the outcomes and the circumstances of the outcomes are massive as well. Takeaway number eight, need to celebrate some teams that are heading to the postseason. Final game of the college football regular season saw Hawaii beat New Mexico. New Mexico was trying to become bowl eligible. When New Mexico lost, that officially meant that 82 teams are now bowl eligible. And good news is there are 82 spots in bowl games that need to be filled. Some of the most significant Virginia Tech beat Virginia, uh, winning the Commonwealth. That was a pretty interesting game, though, because Virginia Tech was five and six. UVA was five and six. Winner goes on. Loser's season is over. Virginia Tech wins. They now go bowling. NC State also clinched a bowl win, a bowl game with their win at North Carolina. North Texas clinches bowl eligibility with a win at Temple. Western Michigan. They win over their rival, Eastern Michigan. Both teams were sitting there at five and six. Winner was in. Western Michigan wins. Congrats to them as they will now play in the postseason. And then Coastal Carolina clinched with the win at Georgia State. A couple teams that came up short in their pursuit of a postseason berth. Auburn loses at Alabama, finishing the season five and seven. Kansas lost at Baylor. They are five and seven. Oregon State lost to Boise. Wisconsin lost to Minnesota. Uh, Michigan State got smoked by Rutgers at home. Thought Michigan State might be able to get that one against Rutgers. They did not. And then Cincinnati lost against TCU. So those teams will all be sitting at home on Christmas and throughout the bowl season. Louisiana Monroe also lost. And it's just also kind of disappointing. It really is. It's super disappointing when these things happen. It really is. I, I always like bowl games. I wish there was a way for everybody to play in bowl games, but they need to matter to an extent. So it is interesting when guys and teams come up short. And it's also interesting too, when they get beat badly when a bowl game is on the line. I always wondered what that might mean as well. Takeaway number nine. We anticipated that this would be a little bit of a slower moving coaching carousel, but things picked up at least for the moment in the last 48 hours. Well, in some cases, a little bit longer than that. Mac Brown has officially coached his final game at North Carolina. He did publicly declare that he would be coming back. I don't think that was ever a reality. Uh, I think he said that because now if you have to fire me, then you get to me, write me a big check uh, as opposed to me retiring. But at 73 years old, who can blame him? Uh, he had a great run throughout the course of his time at North Carolina, 113, 78, and one. 
Um, but they haven't, it was kind of rinse and repeat for North Carolina, wasn't it? It's kind of rinse and repeat where you looked at things and you thought, all right, well, they would start strong and they couldn't finish. And that was the case for a number of years. So it's unfortunate that it won't happen for Mac Brown and North Carolina. Uh, going to be a very interesting coaching search. Freddie Kitchens has been named the interim head coach for now. Uh, I think Freddie Kitchens has a lot of support. And I think Freddie Kitchens, after having served as a head coach in the NFL, maybe he would know how to manage what is a, a situation in college football that is continuously beginning to look more and more like the NFL. But I know that this will be a highly coveted job. Uh, North Carolina, of all the openings right now in the P4, is by far the most attractive. So will this be the job that could get somebody to strongly consider making the move, even though it doesn't, this could even attract a, another P4 candidate, by the way. Like this job is that attractive to many people. So could a sitting P4 coach leave their P4 job for a job at North Carolina? I think that is a possibility. So just keep an eye on that one. Neil Brown is out at West Virginia. Uh, a year after they gave him a moderate extension, it wasn't a long extension by any stretch, but they finished the season six and six. They get blown out by Texas Tech in the finale. Uh, he finished above 500 just one time, and that was last year when they went uh, nine and four. So interesting that this decided to happen now, but it was not surprising. Last year certainly gave him a new lease on life. They finished in a big way. They had really quietly an excellent season last season, but with high expectations and some of the turnover in the Big 12 this season, Neil Brown and company just didn't win enough games. And it felt like it was kind of a long time coming, so it was not a huge surprise. Andy Kotelnicki, the offensive coordinator at Penn State, has already been contacted for the job. So we'll see if he is in pursuit of the West Virginia gig, but that'll be one that will keep you updated on. UCF, maybe one of the more intriguing moves made this, uh, I guess, coaching carousel cycle is Gus Malzahn. And he is now resigning as the UCF head coach to become the offensive coordinator at Florida State. Now, what's most interesting is that UCF was 4-8 and eight this year. Yeah, It was the worst season that Malzahn has had in his four years at UCF. But I think what's interesting about this more than anything else is it feels like a Chip Kelly scenario. Uh, Chip Kelly, obviously money is not an option, uh, an object for Chip Kelly, nor is it for Gus Malzahn. But are they just tired of the administrative processes that is being head coach in the modern day of college football? Probably. Uh, is it more fun to just go call plays? Probably. We're both likely going to be on the hot seat heading into the following season. Yes, more than likely there as well. So maybe Gus Malzahn is resetting the clock and now going to a Florida State program where it can't get much worse than it's been the last 12 months uh, on the offensive side of the football. That includes the bowl game performance last year against Georgia. And then Ryan Walters out after two years at Purdue. Uh, 1-11 and 11 this year. Last year, not great either, just 4-8. and eight. So they're looking for a head coach again. Walters took over for Jeff Brom, made it a very difficult situation, made it just two years, though, and Purdue is pulling the plug. So that one, I don't know if that one's as attractive as some of the others, but I would put them in order of attractiveness. Number one, North Carolina. Number two, uh, UCF. Number three, West Virginia. And number four, Purdue. It might not be the way you guys see it. That's the way I see it. Right now, even though getting into the big two, right, by getting into the big 10 with Purdue would be advantageous, but not many people have won at Purdue over the course of their history. There is one other job that's been filled. That's Casey Keeler. He's going to become the new head coach of Temple's, did a pretty good job at Sam Houston the last few years. The transfer portal also opens next Monday. So players will be on the move here very, very soon, and we'll update you accordingly as this thing goes forward. Texas Tech's Five-star wide receiver Micah Hudson has decided to enter the transfer portal. You saw true freshman wide receivers last year, whether it was Ryan Williams, Jeremiah Smith, and others. A lot of people fired up about young wide receivers. Well, Micah Hudson never really got going this year, so he'll be on the move. We'll see where he ends up. But a few other names that I found intriguing. Uh, Casey Concepcion, 
slot receiver, do it all player for NC State. He's an amazing player. He will be in. He will be highly coveted. I would imagine in the transfer portal. Julian Humphrey uh, at times started at corner for Georgia. Has good length. Has good cover skills, but was a little bit inconsistent. So he'll be. Uh, in hot pursuit at corner as well. Thomas Castellanos at Boston College. We knew he was going to be going in. That was not a surprise. Then one other one that I think has a chance to be pretty good this year, Anthony Calandria. Now, he turned the ball over like crazy at Virginia, but he's got some playmaking ability that just can't be taught. So he'll be worth monitoring, and we'll keep you posted with that one week from the day when the transfer portal officially opens. Takeaway number 10. This college football playoff rankings release on Tuesday might be the most intriguing ever. Now, we know the field is pretty much set. Now, I can tell you with certainty the teams that I think are going to be in. And the bubble is about as small as it can ever be. I think there's really only one spot up for grabs. And it's going to be a conversation that will be fascinating. ACC versus SEC record of 10 and two, or maybe even 11 and two in the event in which SMU loses this weekend being measured against a nine and three SEC football team, whether that's Ole Miss, South Carolina, or Alabama. We'll tell you right now who I think is going to be in. All right. Who I think these are locks. You can just go ahead and bank on it. I think there's 11 spots that are accounted for. All right, Oregon in, Texas in, Penn State in, Notre Dame in, Indiana in. Those teams all sit at 11-1 or better. The one that's better is Oregon. They are 12-0. Then you have three 10-2 teams that I think are in regardless of the outcome this weekend. Ohio State, Tennessee, and Georgia. So that's eight spots that are accounted for right now. All agree? We all in good shape? We'll see. And then you have three conference champions that will get in as well. The Big 12 champ, either Arizona or Iowa State. The ACC champ, either SMU or Clemson. And the group of five champ, probably, given the way things have gone, probably Boise State or UNLV. So that leaves you right now with 11 spots. There are 11 spots that are available, and there's really four teams that are in contention for those 11 spots, at least at the moment. I think you could add a fifth team to this conversation if SMU were to lose. Now, if Clemson were to lose, Clemson, that would be their fourth loss. I don't think there's a chance that they would be out, that they would be in as an at-large situation over the aforementioned three. Miami, they just lost for the second time in the last three games, which means they'll be watching the ACC championship game, and in all likelihood, it's going to hinge on this upcoming rankings release. Are they going to be in front of the SEC trio or will they be behind the SEC trio or will they be behind at least one of the three from the SEC? That will be fascinating. It's going to be measuring resumes really more than anything else. Yes, Miami has the best win-loss record for sure, but there are some common opponents in there as well. Miami, when being measured against, say, Ole Miss. Ole Miss does have a win against the Georgia Bulldogs. That is pretty impressive. Ole Miss also has a win against South Carolina. Also very impressive. Miami's best win right now is against a Louisville team that is not currently in the top 25. Now, will they be this upcoming week? Probably. I think Louisville will be in, but where will they be in? That'll be a fascinating part to manage. The other team that we need to watch at the kind of back end of the rankings, LSU. If LSU is in and Louisville is in, which one of those two is ahead? That could be fascinating because that could give us an indicator of where things might be going when you get to the South Carolina, Ole Miss, Alabama, and Miami. Ole Miss did lose to Florida. Miami beat Florida. So there is a common opponent there that you need to be mindful of. The other thing I would say is that South Carolina, if they're going on team that has played best down the stretch, they're in a great spot. But South Carolina's best win is against Clemson, or you could have made the cases against AM. AM might not even be in the top 25 this upcoming week, whereas Clemson is probably going to drop considerably down the stretch. I think the best way for South Carolina to potentially get in is if Clemson wins the ACC, and then South Carolina could be measured 
knowing that they have beaten a conference champion from a P4 league. Alabama is the other one. Alabama probably has the best resume right now, but they also have some pretty ugly losses as well, including a 21-point loss to a 6-6 six and six Oklahoma football team. But they have beaten Georgia, who is solidly in the field and might win the SEC championship game. That would be a feather in their cap. And they beat South Carolina, who's likely going to be in the top 13 or 14. And depending on what happens with Missouri and LSU, they could have as many as four teams that they beat that are currently in the top 25. So that's worth monitoring as well. So a lot of intriguing things coming up on Tuesday. We hope you'll join us 7 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN for the college football playoff rankings release show. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Continue to encourage all of you to like, to rate, and to subscribe to the show. We've seen our ratings. We've seen our reviews. We've seen a few of you write reviews. Can't tell you how much we appreciate you guys writing reviews, taking the time to do that on the Apple Podcast platform. And for those of you that have taken the time to leave us a rating on Spotify or on the Apple Podcast platform or wherever it is you get your podcast, it is greatly appreciated. You guys have helped neutralize some of the uh, angry ratings that we got when a certain 2-10 and 10 team didn't make the playoffs last year. So you guys have answered the challenge, and we very much appreciate you guys helping us out with that as well. So for all of us here at ACF, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have an amazing day. And remember, it's always college football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.